frontiers of science, a pioneering breed of theoretical physicists and inspired inventors are challenging the way we think about harnessing the unseen forces of nature. Despite ridicule, lack of funding, and outright suppression, they are confronting an outmoded classical worldview and ushering in a monumental scientific revolution. Most people would agree you can't get something for nothing. There's no such thing as a free lunch. And yet, we get our oxygen free from the air we breathe. We get sunlight free and water. That used to be free until bottled drinking water came along. But what about energy? We've always had to pay for that, whether it's wood or coal, oil or electricity. It's always been the rule that you can never get back more energy than what you put in in the first place. That's a fundamental law of nature. Physicists of the 19th century figured that out with the first law of thermodynamics, the conservation of energy. Hmm. Maybe so. But science has come a long way since then. And laws? Well, there's never been one that hasn't been broken. On the subatomic level, I feel that there is a, a dimension shift activated by very conventional electrostatics, RF fields that I use, and Tesla waves that I use, that actually form a keyway that opens up another area of time and space that may activate the zero-point energy fields and interdimensional reactions, let's say, to gravitational waves and time waves, or chronons, if you wish. Perhaps we're dealing in chronons and gravitons, which are maybe particles and somehow causing a distortion which causes obje objects to become weightless or to simply break apart or pulsate in the center uh, of stainless steel bars and fall apart or cause samples to turn transparent. There's one theory. There's many different theories, of course, from various scientists around the world that uh, get into deep mathematics, but I like to be uh, think on the simplistic side and visualize exactly what is going on instead of using that. This kind of power, of course, um, coupled properly, produces these effects on the order of terawatts. It would take terawatts to cause these kind of effects by conventional means to rip apart uh, stainless steel bars and reduce stainless steel and other metals to rubble, cause buildings to disappear, which apparently did happen. Uh, witnessed by an insurance agent and other witnesses. Um, there's quite a host of different effects over the years that did take place. And on the outside too, such as shaking of telephone poles, which is well known, and um, even creation of uh, thunder uh, clouds above the laboratory. So we're dealing in a free energy situation where all the RF power, all the electrical power, or a pure lightning bolt couldn't create the effects of ripping apart the, uh, these pieces of metal and causing things to float in the air like they do. This uh, demonstration here of uh, the objects vibrating was caused actually by uh, self-resonation of what they call ferromagnetic and piezo um, electric and ferromagnetic um, barium type name. And this was used in the Army for levitation experiments. And uh, this particular experiment here is showing a, a crude form of levitation that um, causes heavy objects with seven pounds here to move around on a piece of aluminum plate through self-resonance, which is many bands and frequencies that I was causing. And other objects tend to move around, but only on translational movements. Basically, I'm doing a self-resonation system and adding on to it different carriers um, through the top um, amplifier and uh, tuning in, broadening the, the uh, frequencies, the pulse rate, and that causing it to react in different uh, shapes. So almost controllable translational movement.
There's really no difference on um, the surrounding materials from the main cylinder. Um, it can be plastic, steel, or very heavy objects will tend to slide around a bit. And yet, if you suspend a ring above the um, barium cylinder, you notice that the ring is held by some type of invisible force. So the applications of this in advanced applications using free energy or zero-point energy to power it would be in uh, propulsion technology. And um, that would be applicable to the forces that this type of material puts out. The object you're seeing um, moving there is a form of levitation by uh, translational movement, meaning that the objects become lighter and can float around, the heaviest being the barium cylinder that you see there um, with the two wires coming out of it. it tends to slide around on seven pounds of its own weight. So um, that's basically what um, you're seeing. Uh, the physics of it is uh, self-resonation uh, through a power amplifier and broad and narrow uh, bands of electrical energy going into this crystal. The long-term applications could be used in uh, propul space propulsion and uh, perhaps in medical research and metallurgical research. Well, microphones actually are made out of the same material as a large cylinder of barium titanate and there's a self-resonation effect taking place there. And that goes through the amplifiers, and then I broaden and narrow the, the bandwidths and add pulses in that to create the effects you just seen. The UFOs are just uh, other forms of life from space. Some advanced races, perhaps 15, I'd say roughly maybe 15 light years out, and the start, population starts to increase of uh, different races from very low types of races to races that have excelled in propulsion and time and space and energy. And perhaps they come and monitor our old style radio signals and start laughing. Perhaps not. Maybe their culture is so entirely different that uh, they're just thinking about it and trying to help. So there is a connection. This, this Earth is only an island, really when you look at it on a logical level, on a cosmological level, amongst a sea of, you know, billions of stars, you know, hundreds of thousands of galaxies. And I'm sure they've mastered uh, uh, time and space and uh, interdimensional physics, but they can pass from one dimension to another dimension very quickly. Old space, come and say hi here. So, they mastered all those problems long ago, I feel. I actually had my own encounters with uh, UFOs. And uh, I was not scared. I was very relaxed, actually. As a matter, almost like a matter of fact situation. Nothing really shakes me too much, really. Nothing really shakes me too much, no. I see metal turn and twist, and so on. It's interesting and enjoyable, but I don't jump up and down. I've actually had men, business people, not so much scientists, but business people, go totally mad on me. Or I had to literally kick them out of my laboratory. And these are men from uh, such companies as uh, IBM. But what fascinates me is uh, sometimes the greed of um, the businessman and his money. I've encountered a few times and tend to brush these people off extremely fast because um, they're very friendly at first and then all of a sudden they want something in a nutshell and within a week. And I find it actually quite uh, disgusting because normally it takes uh, a good month and you need to put your energy into it and they're too skimpy to, to get parts, let's say. Um, I've always worked on my own and let the businessmen sweat it out, in a sense, and pull her hair out by the roots, because I always 
I've done my research on my own, and when I'm ready, I just present it to the news media or to anybody who's interested. This demonstration today, uh, using 20,000 volts direct current, um, powering these uh, Tesla type of corona suppressors, um, illustrates um, directed energy at a distance on a very low level. The barium titanate cylinder acts as a large capacitor boosting the power up. And uh, the energy coming off these terminals actually sets off uh, various objects um, powered by batteries and uh, other obscure effects in that, indicating that, um, that in my previous work there, of course, that I was using only 4,000 watts power. But on conventional terms, <coughs> we come out to approximately uh, measured in terawatts to create the effects on large metal samples. So this is a minor uh, uh, demonstration here showing some of the uh, interesting effects of sparks and damped oscillation waves coming off from these terminals. Basically, you start with very old germanium diodes <coughs> that you were under stress for many years and electronic equipment do have a, their own output. Getting this idea, I decided, well, I will use materials that are natural in nature, that are crystalline in structure, and compress them and heat them and put them into rather a blob of material, and see what kind of reaction I got. And um, I found that they had quite a quite a action. I studied um, Putoff's work on zero point energy, Dr. Froning, Douglas' work on zero point energy. I thought that the only way that really you have some viable type of device is it has to be a crystalline, basically a crystalline entity unto itself so that you have all the different crystalline lattices can act and all the ions, electrical ions and electrons can come out and go to a central location and collect on the anode, a post, and come off. And the rest, the negative fellows, can go to the sides and come off. And I found that number one uh, cylinder worked great. Number two was a, was a blob of material, of course, to show people at uh, the basic looking right at it. And then I did experiments with different cylinders and found higher results, some getting actually very hot, meaning there's quite an overload in power. And then they cool down. Others would get cold. Others would be just right to just turn the motor a little bit. And then basically doing that research, I found that the problem there is that basically every cylinder has to be made exactly the same so that everything can work in series. So you can connect one cell to another cell to another cell to another cell. So you can theoretically get up to 110, 130, 150 volts. And then put them in, in, um, in parallel to add for your amperes. So if you had a milk crate, let's say, of these little cells all working in harmony, uh, then you have quite a power pack. And Fortunately, these things seem to last forever. I've given, given them many stress tests, dead shorts, and they still keep on working. And um, yeah, that's, that's interesting that they can be put in series and also cast in any shape or form. And my idea was to actually cast them in the shape of a UFO or a Star Trek type device and put them out as a toy where kids can play with it and uh, actually say, well, where's the power coming from? No, it's just this space-time jitter that uh, the scientists like to talk about. Using common minerals, I'm able to capture the um, jitter of the zero-point energy that's the talk, hot talk of many physicists around the world. And I'm able to create uh, cells and structures similar to this one here that actually produce power 
for long periods of time. As you can see, we're getting a reading here of almost half an electron volt from this um, pile of um, crystals. And this is steady and has been tested up to a year's time and under stress tests also. So, which made me decide to then, of course, mount the same material in cylinders. And these cylinders here, of course, are various types of cylinders. One being an artillery shell or aluminum cylinders. Um, I could take this one here and do a reading on him. And actually, you cannot see that, but we'll try here. I can't quite tell what we're getting. About half a volt. About half electron volt. And this guy here. Different cylinders, of course, there are different mixes in there, and I found that uh, that some of the cylinders are not as powerful as this material here, or this very tiny one here. Actually, this has more power than this large artillery shell unit here. And what I want to do, of course, is to um, <coughs> demonstrate it in the sense of it making actual power. That means to turn a small motor. And that can be done. I've accomplished that many, many times. We're just taking a reading here on the very small one. One cubic inch of um, raw material from the earth. It's still powering for over a year. Basically, I want to use these as replacements for batteries, which I think I can achieve. And um, to demonstrate even more so, I'm looking for a hot cylinder, which I'll call a hot one. Well, maybe be this one, which is a combination of material from this little cylinder back into here. Instead, actually, well, we can take a volt ohm meter reading on him and see if he's up the far. We get 1.635 electron volts, so I think that he's lively enough to power this little motor. We'll find out. So I'm holding this motor here. I attach a lead to the base. Get him out of the way. Okay, I'm attaching this to the base here. Another lead to the top, and it should spin, which it does. So you have basically this kind of material powering motors. Of course, a very small motor at this time, but scaled up in larger amounts of, of material and power up to uh, several horsepower if needed. That basically is sort of the secret to the energy crisis, in my opinion, anyhow. Just using ordinary materials, non-toxic, that will interface with zero-point energy in space and time. Now we're taking a reading of one of the most powerful ones, the 1.635 volts fluctuating a bit, but uh, very steady and strong. And that was the one that powered the little motor. There's quite a host of natural, non-toxic non um, minerals in there that uh, activate. Much similar to the Moray valve of 1927, where Moray used natural minerals and got a lot of power in the range of uh, about 5,000 watts usable power at um, 110 volts at 400 cycles per second. Long wire antenna. Using basically the same kind of principles. It's sort of a shake and bake recipe. It's extremely simple, ridiculously simple. And I do that. I simply just put it in, heat it up, shake it around, and let it crystallize. And once it's crystallized, then the, it, it catches and, and conforms to the zero point energy that's around all of us. And uh, actually, I find the most simple, simplest of the recipes the most powerful, meaning 
this little fellow here, where I tried to advance the uh, st field strength or the energy. However, failing in, in a few of these cylinders, which are quite, as one would say, we would only put out milli millivolts. Um, this one here is another powerhouse unit. Being smaller, actually, they tend to get stronger. Again, it's reading about um, similar to this pile here. And again, I should take a reading on this because He's quite interesting to a lot of people, being the smallest of them. That would be approximately a third of a volt. Always steady, always strong. I've used direct shorts on these kind of together for days at a time, and they still, still keep on pumping out energy. Some explanations, of course, can be found in solid-state uh, physics in the old ham radio magazines when transistors were first coming out. And that will help the viewer to uh, see some of the uh, technology in those days and to the f for the future can see also the possibilities of uh, what they call space charge and junction barrier type of technologies and crystals. The interesting aspect of this technology is that these cells, crystalline cells, can be put in series and parallel to add up voltage and also add up amperage. So theoretically, if you had a room or a refrigerator full of them, you could power a lot of different types of appliances. You can, you can have 110 volts if you wish, if you had them all in series and in parallel for the amps. Plus, well, also, they'd, they cooperate with one another going in series and parallel makes them quite practical. Plus they're very cheap to make and they are basically from just nature's own raw minerals. No poisons or toxins or radioactive material. In size, the size doesn't matter because that uh, the zero point energy of a cubic foot is so immense, the power source, the refinement of the crystal lean material itself is the finer it is refined down to crystalline lattices and that in the matrix. The more that this uh, c matrix can grab of the zero point energy jitter. So size is not that important. It's just the quality it actually is. So you can get down to very small size units like this, which actually can theoretically um, eliminate batteries. Make it in the form of a battery and have it last forever. There is a danger, however, that you may tap too much uh, zero-point energy and then, of course, these things would heat up and explode, which has happened a few times with these devices of mine. So, in essence, uh, it's an interesting technology to get involved in, but I notice that there's some precautions one needs to take if you're having too much drawing of, from the electromagnetic jitter of, of um, zero-point energy you're going to get a minor meltdown. And I had to clean this area out here once because of a minor meltdown. We discovered in 1979 through Tesla technology and introduced in the into the scientific community by a group from Toronto um, has gained interest in the U.S. government who ran tests on it and various other agencies th through the United States and Germany up until 1989 when I wanted to immigrate to Germany. Uh, the Canadian government was activated by civilians to confiscate my lab. Uh, we've had about 750 demonstrations of levitations, translational movements, uh, metallurgical samples falling apart, uh, changing into transmuted unknown metals. Uh, quite a variety of obscure types of effects, wood impregnated into uh, metals, other objects in metals, uh, monopole uh, magnetic fields written up in many journals. Um, quite a host or a Pandora's box of different types of effects on the outer edge of, of the scientific uh, community. When I was to go to Germany, invited by the Austrian 
uh, group and the German groups, all the funds were available to move to get me out of Canada because it was not conducive because I was going to be put into the military for psychotronic research. This is all actually on record uh, by Boeing Aerospace Group in Seattle. Uh, Kovacs, one name. I have all, all this on documents. Now, I decided this to time, time to pull out, finally from the military, and go to Germany and do this research. And this did transpire. I did get to Germany. The um, shipping containers were loaded and ready to go on a ship. This is all in records. And um, certain civilians were screaming and yelling, basically, to the Prime Minister's office saying, well, John doesn't know what he's doing, he's taking this technology to Germany, and then he's committing treason. Whereas so much pressure from the Prime Minister uh, was put on him, he, um, plus his civilians were making up stories that there was one gram of radium, that everything was contaminated with PCBs. So basically what happened was there was so much pressure that the minister then went down to the lower ranks to actually environment officials, police, and um, even NBC got involved, phoning me up if I'm kidnapped. <coughs> so the lab was actually seized by the Canadian officials and held actually in Surrey, part of it, and, but anything dealing with Tesla equipment was gone, disappeared, and I cannot find out to this day whatever happened to it. The politicians that I contact will not talk about the topic, I have used uh, many different threats in regards to the media, um, and actually the media tried, but find that my file is classified, and that um, also, <coughs> also I um, put pressure on other members of Parliament, as they're called in Canada, to act, but uh, no response. And I was actually tricked. <coughs> I don't want to sound paranoid, but I was tricked to come back here by a CSIS agent, Bob Gairuski, which is actually on Telex from the, um, in Munich, from the Consular General, Manfred Spies, that I have a copy of, who is going to pay my way back to Canada. And when that transpired, the Telex said the funds were being transferred to Bonn. But when I got back to Canada, I was stuck with the air, air flight costs. So the story from then on gets into quite a bit of a spy novel. And um, to this day, I don't know what happened to all that equipment. I know Washington was involved, D.C. that is, by different parties telling me different stories. At least I got some of it on record. The house I was staying at in Austria was raided by Interpol to see that I, if I was kidnapped, and I had to assure them I was not kidnapped, Henry Champ of NBC phoned me and asked, asked me if I was kidnapped. I said, no, sir, I'm not kidnapped. So I went on from there, and it was quite a hassle. And when I came back here, I had to deal with a lot of government officials. And they said, well, you have to put my lab back in a secure location and get it in operation. Now, this is only test equipment, like you see around me here. And gave me the keys to the Surrey locker, which I re promptly removed the equipment, took it to my sister's garage in New Westminster here, and of course imme immediately put an ad in the buy and sell, meaning a local newspaper, for all ham radio operators to come down and buy all the equipment, defying, of course, the Canadian government, which I love doing on many occasions. <laughs> um, then was to return to Germany to immigrate, but uh, events changed, and uh, uh, Jap Japanese people got involved in my, uh, my scientific activities and also there was negotiations on immigrating again to Europe. So things sort of drifted uh, from that and uh, also the events gave scientists uh, time to catch up to these astounding fantastic effects that uh, are on the uh, video. Here we have a 
collection of samples from 1979 to 1989 of uh, metal pieces uh, done by the Hutchison Effect apparatus. And we're going to start with the very first sample, which uh, gained a lot of history around the world and also in a lot of uh, national laboratories, which is this very large, heavy steel bar. As you can see here, the crumbling, ma crumbling material here is off the end of this bar here. And actually, it's a transmuted material that has, is unknown um, in the metallurgical handbooks. And this particular sample has been to Germany, um, to in the United States, <coughs> the United States National Laboratories, also in Japan, and other locations. And um, extremely rare material that appears to be a major uh, transmutation. Now, getting into another sample here, we find a heavy piece of what they call extruded brass that exploded with inside itself, ripping it into this pattern here, ripping it apart. Very heavy, dense material. This is another time frame of about 1987-88. Coming to this sample here of aluminum, we find that something wanted to get outside of the metal itself. And looking at it, you can see that the pressures inside of it indeed tried to get out. And going to samples that have um, other samples sitting on top of them, we have here a knife <coughs> that was on a sample that got itself embedded into the sample. And um, apparently some type of transparency perhaps did happen. This particular sample was anchored down and a machine was given to shave off the top layer of aluminum to get to this level here. This is extrusion alloy, not cast aluminum. And if you observe very carefully, there's a shadow of the knife itself embedded in, in the metal here on the back. Well, that's a stainless steel kitchen knife embedded in a piece of extruded alloy. We get to a piece of, again, extrusion with uh, a piece of wood inside that uh, has actually came up several times in various samples analyzed in Germany and at the National Laboratories wood mixed in with the structure itself. And we're not sure exactly on this sample how much wood, maybe a cubic inch or more inside here. And coming to other samples, we find again samples that have ripped themselves apart and rejoined, as you can see in this little sample here. And then we come to breaks that indicate actually a lot of stress, as it's a nice clean cut and looks like a bent stress. So this is broken in a fashion perhaps like that. And then, on the other side of the coin, we come to something that looks like it was ripped apart or turned to jelly and ripped apart and frozen in time and space. This large aluminum sample, again, extrusion alloy, was once one piece and was totally uh, formed like this after some experiments, actually seen on video. We come to more hard materials, such as stainless steel, that have just bent and twisted around with a lot of little pot marks and pieces falling out of it. Again, similar to the large uh, piece of steel that I just mentioned, for it being the very first uh, sample. And um, this is just many of many samples that I do have and that other people do have that are still are undergoing analysis around the world. And new theories are coming up almost weekly on what has happened here. On conventional physics, it would take terawatts of power to do this. There's no radio waves or anything that can do this. There's no electrostatic fields or lightning bolts that can do this. Um, so in a way, the theory is, a uh, key way is made up of electromagnetic and electrostatic fields that I produce, opening a doorway into another dimension that allows any kind of amount of energy to come in and do this to create these effects. And um, 
<clears throat> that must be on the order of terawatts to do this. Um, we've had larger samples, of course, fall apart, and break apart. And um, basically, again, it seems to come back into a circle that uh, the universe supplies all the energy needed um, for mankind and also for uh, propulsion and space travel. I don't go into mathematics at all. I visualize things and always joust, so to speak, uh, the uh, conventional scientists or the scientists with the mathematics by saying that intuition is a shortcut through math. I visualize this and I put it in the best words that I can find. I can actually see the atom. I can see the different interactions of the dimensions inside of an atom. And I can explain it in, in those terms, visualize it, and actually do it physically. But mathematically, I am a basket case when it comes to um, trying to understand mathematics. And uh, I only use math in, in quantity. Like in electricity, I need mathematics. In electromechanical engineering, I need mathematics, just me basic measurements. But, um, when it comes to the exotic math, I'm a lost cause, so I must rely on intuition, which gives me a lot more to see and a lot more to do. I believe in putting, doing it, making the thing in reality, instead of just drawing up a lot of numbers. There's a little bit of backbiting, but there's a lot around the world of scientists, very high-powered scientists, that were involved in the old Star Wars program, talking a lot of this now. They get into the psychic aspects of it, and also the... Uh, the physics aspect of it also. A lot of the work is um, coming out and released uh, out of Lawrence Livermore. Uh, still, Los Alamos is a little tight, but it's slowly loosening up. Colonel Alexander now is into remote viewing. Uh, he's the head fellow involved in non-lethal weapon technology. He made an appearance on a program called Encounters. Ed Dames is now out of uh, the INSCOM group. Security Command Group, now is on sightings. So there's a wave of media also coming forth, um, such as these programs showing what is really going on. Even ABC and NBC did a special on is remote viewing true or false, and they've got a, a positive um, uh, situation on one half hour program. ABC, I believe, or NBC, I'm one of the big networks in the States. So there's a lot of breakthrough in media coming slowly, but it's coming out more and more. And this will give people something to look at and think about. I think the mind can act as also a uh, coherer of frequencies and transmit them out, and then lock this doorway into space and time. Some measurements at Stanford University and UCLA, um, <coughs> Lawrence Livermore, Hen Dr. Henry Strapp, uh, William Tiller put it at around 22 to 24 uh, centimeter wave, wave band that a lot of this activity happens at. And their tests are quite exhaustive and um, quite extensive, giving a lot of interesting results. <coughs> With McDonnell Douglas, they do a m multitude of spoon bending where they take control samples and then, of course, they put them under the electron scanning microscope to see if they were bent by force or by, by mind. So breakthroughs are being done by Mr. Jan of Princeton University, who also is connected to McDonnell Douglas. And I'm not surprised even now if they have come across a uh, formula on this um, area of physics, which has to be included Everything is connected to everything else, in my opinion. Psychic to um, hardcore physics, let's say. Outer fringe physics, time and space, cosmology, you name it. Biology, electrobiochemistry, it's all related. It's all part of the universe as well. Okay, we want to basically replace all fossil fuels, all nuclear fuels, get them out of the way. Have a technology that works in a natural sense with uh, space-time continuum with nature, uh, that it can be strong and helpful and also in, in elimination of all the toxic waste, the millions of tons of toxic uh, waste laying around. Uh, devices could be used to 
carry this off, levitate it out into space and dump it in the sun. It wouldn't hurt the sun. So it's such a small quantity. It would be a very small quantity to the sun. Um, otherwise, uh, Mother Nature is just going to pack it in for us, I feel. I don't want to be a, um, sound like a person gloom and doom, but it's starting to show in plagues, um, in, in environmental problems with trees because of satellite transmissions working on the millimeter wavelengths on, on to pine needles. The forests are going, the oceans are getting polluted. Uh, there's mad cow disease, there's the talk of reversal of the poles, there's worry of the ionosphere. So mankind really has to get his act together um, and not concentrate so much on greed and war and all this stuff, or oil and that, but basically focus on um, a more promising future in medicine, in health, in energy, environment, and really get a role on, similar to the NASA project of the uh, 60s, where there was everybody was excited about going to the moon. Well, this can also be applicable to environmental and also applicable to a situation where it would be feasible to actually get into uh, space flight again. Give mankind something better to do than pick around on his neighbors and what kind of race or what kind of color. I mean, it's pretty pathetic. And Mother Nature will just go on anyway. As we lay here suffocating, um, or burning up, or pole shifts, or earthquakes, time still goes on. Time still moves on through Mother Nature. So the technology in itself is has to come out, either if not from me, from other scientists, such as Dr. Rauscher or Al Pidoff, who can bring it out into the world and um, bring it so it uh, can be used very quickly, manufactured very quickly. And uh, that just basically has to be done. For the future, I hope to develop these technologies and get them rolling. I have a totally new approach to it all, especially in the Hutchison Effect area. The other technologies, the crystalline converters, that's pretty well wrapped up and just waiting for a company. Perhaps Japan will market it or somebody in the U.S. will get it out there and then I can attend to the other interesting aspects. you can get even more valuable information and details from the new energy series. Five full-length videos, nine hours of in-depth conversations and demonstrations of free energy systems. Explore the worlds of inventors and theoretical physicists who are changing the paradigms of science. Volume First one all, features Tom physics. Bearden. In particle physics, any electrical charge is automatically a broken symmetry. Now what this means is there is a virtual photon flux, a violent flux exchange between the vacuum itself, which is filled with this virtual photon flux. Volume two, John Hutchison. I feel that that is also true. I think the mind can act as also a uh, coherer of frequencies and transmit them out and then lock this doorway into space and time. This motor here drew 12 and a half amps. Volume three, Joseph Newman. This motor right here only draws seven and a half amps. And look at the size of the propeller. Look at the size of the propeller. Look at the size of the motor. Look at the size of the motor. Now, this is exactly what I teach throughout my book. I taught it to Dr. Hastings. I've taught it to the world. But the larger you make the mass, then the, the smaller amount of power it will take and the more power it will produce. Volume 4 highlights prototype. Troy Reed. This is an old mechanical device. It's got, it's got two inner wheels 
on the inside, the two outer shell wheels with magnets. They got eight magnets on this side, eight magnets on the inside here. Let's see what kind of torque we got at 75 PSI. And volume PRE. five, Dennis Lee. Okay, here goes. <laughs> Maxed it out. So it went all the way off the end of this thing, 150 foot-pounds of torque by this engine. They're just $29.95 the for each tape. Now the process or get all here, five for uh, $119.95, a savings of $30. Glacier order cycle. today. Call 1-800-795-TAPE, T-A-P-E. A right to Lightworks Audio and Video, Post Office Box 661593, Los Angeles, California, 90066. And now you can order this and many other fine tapes on the internet at www.lightworksav.com. That's lightworksav.com, as in Lightworks Audio and Video.